Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Vinyl Thoughts. It's time for another collection video. Today, we're gonna to be going through my Iron Maiden vinyl collection. And since this is a collection video, this is also the return of the old head drinking game. How do you play the old head drinking game? It's simple. Grab your drink of choice, and uh, every time you hear me say the phrases, so yeah, or there you go, you take a little shot or a drink or however drunk you actually want to get. Um, so yes, but I'm going to be trying my best to not say any of those fucking things today. Let's see how that goes. Um, let's jump right in to my Iron Maiden collection. So as usual, we're going to be starting from the most recent and working our way back. So of course, uh, we're going to be starting with uh, the most recent Iron Maiden album from uh, 2015, uh, The Book of Souls. This is a, it's a big motherfucker. It's a bunch of records, a big old, big old gatefold thing here. Let's see if we can even, can you guys, look at that. Look how epic that looks. Um, so yeah, um, and there's nothing special about this version. This is a black vinyl version that came out when the album came out. Um, so there's not a whole lot to look at here. Um, newer vinyl, as you know, is not near as interesting to me. So yeah, there you go. Fuck, let's move on. Moving backward five years to 2010, uh, we have The Final Frontier. Um, this is, uh, in my opinion, a really fucking strong album. And uh, this is an original vinyl release from when it came out, which uh, the cool thing about this is that it is um, picture discs. There you, there you go. I just said, there you go. Fuck, I'm really screwing up, aren't I? Um, yeah. And um, honestly, I'm not big on picture discs because usually the quality of the sound from a picture disc is not as good as just your regular old vinyl. Um, so um, I probably would have gotten a different version if it was available, but the original version of this album um, came out just like this. But it's pretty cool. And uh, honestly, oh. I was upside down. Honestly, as uh, as picture discs go, it's probably one of the better sounding ones that I own. Um, Final Frontier, I'm not gonna say it, let's move on. Now we're gonna skip all the way back to 1992, because honestly, anything between 92 and uh, the Final Frontier, I'm not totally stoked on owning on vinyl. Eventually, I'll get around to having everything, but, um, I'm not in a hurry for those albums. Uh, but uh, we're also gonna be looking at the only reissue that I have in my collection. All of the vinyl I have is original copies from the years the album came out. This one is a 2015 repressing of Fear of the Dark, the 1992 album. Uh, the last one with uh, Bruce Dickinson at the time. And um, really, like, the thing that I've noticed because I do bitch a lot about uh, reissues but the Iron Maiden ones for the most part from what I've seen and what I've heard they're pretty good so I don't really have a lot to complain about but um, I really like Fear, Fear of the Dark but when it get when you get to 90s vinyl let's look at the inside here when you uh, when you get to 90s vinyl it just gets really expensive trying to find original copies because they didn't make as many in the 90s because CDs was all were all the rage um, Fear of the Dark. I didn't say it again. <laughs> Moving back to 1990. No Prayer for the Dying, an album that I totally love. A lot of people like to hate on it. Um, at this point, I, I feel like if you're not into No Prayer for the Dying, I don't know if I necessarily want to hang out with you because I don't think you'll be, be very fun at parties. Um, but uh, this is a, I, I think this is a great album. If you watch my Iron Maiden album ranking, which I may post a link down to down in the description. Um, you'll hear me talk all about the things that I like about this album. And um, it's the first one with Janik Gers, who cares, <laughs> on, uh, on guitar. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a 1990, I just keep flipping it around. Let's look at the inner sleeve since we're talking about originals here. Um, the inner sleeve, I think for the most part when they did reissues, they kept the inner sleeves and stuff exactly as they were. And um, I also like, I like the labels of Iron Maiden albums. I think pretty much from the get-go, they weren't just going with your standard record label issue, you know, logo 
kind of uh, labels. And that's always fun. Some of you probably want to have a drink. I'm sorry if you're getting thirsty. So yeah, there you go. No prayer for the dying. Let's move back to 1988. Seventh son of a seventh son. At this point, we're getting into unfuckwithable territory of Iron Maiden. Everything from here back. Um, I don't think anyone's going to really gripe much about. But um, I, I, this is just absolute classic Maiden. And um, I just love the way these records sound. Like the music that they created and the way that the music was produced, to me, sounds the best on vinyl. I'm not one of those people that tries to say that uh, vinyl is, uh, is better, superior to CDs, um, because technically that's, there's flaws in that logic. But I do think that in many cases I enjoy the sound of vinyl much more than any other medium, especially when it comes to albums like this one right here. 1986, Somewhere in Time. Uh, not only is this in my top five of ultimate Iron Maiden albums, um, it's probably my number two when it comes to artwork, maybe number three. Mm, I'm gonna give it number two. Because um, there's so much going on in the artwork and I've always really liked that about this album, that there's so many little hidden things that you can find in the art and um, that's the kind of thing that like isn't done enough anymore. Um, but yeah, this is a 1986 uh, pressing of this. Look at that. I don't know what. Is that supposed to be some sort of space age vehicle they're on? And it's... <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get the point of that, but it's a cool picture anyway. So um, there you go. See? Oh, I said there you go. Have a drink. Um, once again, the labels looking cool as fuck. And uh, this album is cool as fuck. Somewhere in time. Now let's move back to 1985 for uh, the Live After Death live album. Th you know, honestly, that's pretty fucking great artwork as well. I was leaving this one out. Maybe this one will be my fourth favorite uh, Maiden artwork. Um, but this is, uh, this is a great live album. Look at all that. This is from, you know, the, obviously the, the Power Slave tour. And um, by all accounts, it was like a motherfucker of a show. That's probably one of the ones that if I could make a, a time machine to go back, it's all the same shit, uh, to go back in time to watch a show, uh, this would be one of the ones I would want to go to. To uh, Oh, there you go. A whole, bunch, a whole bunch of pictures. I'm going to slowly go so you can just take a little look at like everything there. Look at that. Okay, and then, um, but wait, there's more. Um, this is a double vinyl, but also it comes with this cool little booklet. Um, like, look at the stage set. I don't know. That there's something so epic about them at this time that is just so great. So it's got all the tour dates in here and some other pictures. Um, cool. You know, look at that one. Bam. Steve Harris looking awesome as always. Uh, more pictures and more tour dates and other sort of credits. Uh, crew listed. Oh, it's got the crew, the daily crew work schedule. That's pretty sweet. Um, and then, of course, on the back, you have some more live shots. And um, but there's also another uh, another vinyl in here. But we'll just look at the actual uh, sleeve since it's the same exact thing. Um, some credits, some more photos. There you go. I don't want to rob you guys of these bad boys right here. Is that the, be the best Dave Murray picture ever? <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, there you go. Incredible live album, Live After Death from 1985. Now let's move back a year and let's talk about Power Slave. Um, yeah, another one of my favorite cover, or I'd say this is probably number three for me. Um, I, I could see an argument for it being somebody's number one for Iron Maiden cover art because it's, it's fucking great. And this album is fucking great. This, this album is kind of a tie, I think, for my favorite Maiden album. This is probably my favorite Bruce Dickinson error, era. There was no error there, folks. I don't know why I said it that way. Um, there was no, uh, this is my favorite Bruce Dickinson era album, um, which is interesting because, uh, there you go, drink. Um, because on my uh, album ranking, I think I put this one second, and then my number one of the ranking 
wasn't actually my favorite Iron Maiden album. I tried to be a little more subjective. Is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, when I did my ranking. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. But Power Slave uh, was my number two. And I would say probably when it comes to albums that I listen to the most for Iron Maiden, this is probably legit my number two. All right, now on to the really fun shit. Uh, the Two Minutes to Midnight 12-inch single. You know how much I love 12-inch singles. There you go. Look, record contains language that some people may find offensive. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, pretty great artwork for this. So uh, this one has Two Minutes to Midnight from Power Slave, uh, but it also has Rainbow's Gold, which is a cover of a song by a band called Beckett, I believe. Um, and then my favorite part of this one is that it has Mission from Airy, which, uh, first of all, that's, that's a fucking killer photo of Iron Maiden. Um, Mission from Airy is uh, a, a recorded argument between uh, Steve Harris and Nico McBrain that was secretly recorded uh, by uh, Bruce Dickinson. And for some reason, it's just really funny, especially at the end when Steve Harris, is, Harris realizes that it's being recorded. But I always liked that um, on one of their singles, they just decided to put this recorded argument between the two of them. And um, if you haven't heard it, look it up. I'm sure it's on YouTube. Mission from Ari, A-R-R-Y, uh, by Iron Maiden. It's, it's, it's fun to listen to. Where are we now? Oh, 1983, Peace of Mind, the second album with Bruce Dickinson on vocals. Um, and once again, it's fucking killer. Also the first album to feature Nico McBrain on drums. And would you, I mean, I could say the same thing about all of these albums, that they're all just fucking stone cold classic albums. Um, there you go. And oh, I, hey, there you go, another drink, two drinks. Bam, I just helped you out. Um, I always like the label of that one. There you go, it's the same thing on both sides, but either way. Fun to look at. Uh, so yes, once again, 1983 pressing of Peace of Mind. And um, it's a banger, folks. Time for another 12-inch single, The Trooper. I guess they call them maxi singles, which I, I remember that being a thing. But I just call them 12-inch singles. Um, so it's got The Trooper, and it's got a cover of Cross-Eyed Mary by Jethro Tull. And God damn it, the Iron Maiden version is a vast improvement <laughs> over that song. I'm not a Jethro Tull fan. Um, but uh, this is a cool, I mean, once again, it's just one of those things where if you're really into Maiden, um, getting their singles is uh, pretty much a, uh, a given. Because um, it's, I don't know, for some reason, some bands seem, especially when you're dealing with artwork, some bands just seem like their singles uh, are way a, a way bigger part of the story of the band's discography. And I think with Iron Maiden, that's definitely true. 1982, The Number of the Beast, arguably the most famous, most popular Iron Maiden album. Um, this was my number one in my Iron Maiden album ranking, uh, mostly because, well, I explain it in the fucking video. Uh, but this is not my favorite Maiden album. I just feel like overall, when you're dealing with quality of the album and historically, the significance of it all and its reach and, and, and you know, influence and shit, um, this is a, a fucking big one. In not only with Iron Maiden, but with metal in general. Um, no uh, fancy inner sleeve on this one, because I think that, yeah, I got the version that has a lot of the credits on the back. I don't remember. I think this may have been a UK pressing of it. I'm not quite sure. Um, but uh, it's still got, look, that. I mean, that's, that's probably my favorite label of any of their albums. And then the other side just has some song tracks. Song tracks? You know what I'm saying. I feel like this is one of those albums that if you don't own it, um, are you really a metalhead? All right, who's up for another single? Run to the Hills, maxi single. Um, that is pretty goddamn cool artwork. Um, and then a uh, cool picture of the band. It's got Run to the Hills, and um, it doesn't list the other track, but the other track on here is called Total Eclipse. And Total Eclipse is an uh, Iron Maiden original that was recorded, I believe, at the same time as the Number of the Beast album, but they chose it as a B-side. And um, it's pretty goddamn strong for a B-side. Uh, so this is one of those singles I'd say just pick it up for that song alone. Stepping back to 1981, 
for the Made in Japan EP, uh, a live EP recorded obviously in Japan. Um, and this is the last recording I believe they released with Paul Diano on vocals. And also, I think the original artwork, you can probably find it online, Eddie is holding up the severed head of Paul Diano. And um, I guess very quickly, their manager was like, let's not do that. <laughs> and honestly, I think this is a pretty iconic um, album cover anyway. Once again, you're boring, boring sleeve, nothing going on. And really the record, that's, that's all you get. Not bad, but at least it's not, you know, vanilla and just has a, a record label logo on it. Hanging out here in 1981, my favorite Iron Maiden album, Killers. I don't have a lot of an explanation as to why this is my favorite. It's just the one that I put on the most. Like if I go to listen to Iron Maiden, I grab this album a lot. Could also be because this is also my favorite Iron Maiden cover art, um, which I got the, the little Funko of, see? How cute. Um, but yeah, so this is the last full length album with Paul Diano on vocals. And arguably you could say that the debut is better than this album, but I don't know what it is about this one. This is one that the songs are ones that um, I come back to a lot and um, I just really enjoy it. And it's at this point, you're just comparing classics to classics. <laughs> and so it's one of those things where it's like, it's not even worth talking about. This is just a uh, badass album in a sea of badass Iron Maiden albums. All right, heading back to 1980. Finally, we're getting there, folks, but not quite yet. Um, the uh, Women in Uniform 12-inch single. Um, this is interesting to me because this is uh, the only single they released where the lead song is not theirs. Women in Uniform is a song originally done by a band called Skyhook, I believe. Um, and honestly, I like that version too. I, I, their song's great. This one is awesome. Um, but this has... Uh, uh, Invasion, which Invasion is a, a, an original Iron Maiden track um, that I don't think is on any any albums either. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then Phantom of the Opera live uh, in 1980. Um, once again, this is with Paul Diano on vocals. And um, I, don't, I don't know. There's several different pressings from 1980 of this. And this one says 45 tours on it. And I don't know what that means. I've never been able to figure out what that means. If anybody knows, uh, put that down in the comments because I'm real. I'm really curious because some versions from 1980 don't say that. So there you go. Go drink. Um, yeah, not a lot going on there, but it's a it's a fun single for sure. All right, sticking around in 1980, uh, the debut Iron Maiden album called Iron Maiden, and this one is. Uh, when it comes to debut albums, this is pretty goddamn good. Like up there with some of the best debut albums ever made. Once again, Paul Diano on vocals. It also this is also Dennis Stratton. I, I didn't even mention that. Um, Dennis Stratton was the guitar player that was in the band prior to Adrian Smith joining. And I believe this and then Women in Uniform, he's on that, and then he wasn't in the band anymore. Um, this one is a pretty basic. Harvest Records logo. This is finally the first one where we don't have a, uh, a cool Maiden kind of design on the label. Also, I didn't point out that both of my uh, Maiden and Killers, Iron Maiden and Killers albums are US versions from 1980 and they both include extra tracks. Um, on this one, the song Sanctuary uh, is included, which in the UK original versions, that's not there. I think that was a B-side of a, a single of that I don't have. <laughs> so um, yeah, Iron Maiden, it's just look at it. Okay, we're gonna wrap this up with one that's kind of from 1980 and kind of not. Um, this is a, uh, a double LP of the first two Iron Maiden 12 inch singles. Um, they did a series of reissues in 1990 if you look here, called The First 10 Years, and each one included two 12-inch singles. And uh, at the end of the second record, there's also a track um, called Listen With Nico, where Nico just talks about the songs that are on the the uh, singles that are in this. So it's kind of cool. Um, but this is the, the first, no, no, this was their first, let's talk about them backwards as we're going backwards. 
So uh, this is uh, Sanctuary. Turns out I do have this, folks. <laughs> Did, I had no fucking clue. Um, the Sanctuary, let's just, let's just take a look here. It's a Sanctuary with Drifter. With, with Drifter would end up on Killers, I believe. Uh, and then I've got The Fire, which is a cover of a Montrose song. And um, all, all pretty good shit there. And then let's take a look at this one. I think they kept, yeah, they kept with the OG style labels for these. Um, and yeah, these are ones that, aside from collecting the originals, which I would like to have, it's nice to have this little spoken part with by Nico because everybody knows he's he's a total cut up, and it's just fun hearing him talk about shit, um, especially in the cases of these where he wasn't even involved in them, and so he's pretty funny um, when he's talking about them. But and then of course the uh, the debut single, which is Running Free. Um, which Running Free is one of my favorite Iron Maiden songs. It's up there in my top 10 for sure. And uh, Running Free, um, here you go. That's that's the back. You see they have the backs of the EPs in here. Um, Running Free with Burning Ambition. Burning Ambition um, is an original Steve Harris composition that I think they said he wrote a little while before and they recorded it in 1979. Um, and I think it's the only recording that has Doug Sampson on drums. I might be wrong, but um, I think that's the case. So, yeah, there you go. Get another drink in because we're fucking done here, folks. Uh, the, last, the last one of my collection is this double running free in Sanctuary uh, double single. I said double twice. You should just drink for that because I'm an idiot. So, yeah, there you go. Drink up. Um, my Iron Maiden collection. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I tried to go quickly, but it seems like we're probably already going to be pushing 30 minutes on this video anyway. So if you made it all the way through, you are a trooper. Get it? All right. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again very soon.